So it's sort of interesting when I met Matt, um, you know, he told me about his role at Blackstone. Of course, I'm going to let him describe his role. But what he runs is this organization that is sort of a central, I'm not sure they're going to like this word, AI factory yep. uh, uh, and data science factory at Blackstone that works across their portfolio companies. And immediately what that tells me is sort of the value of AI to, hey, if we can spread this around all of the companies that we own and we invest in, there's some real value to be captured. And I love having this perspective from the investment community because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, our stock prices all depend on what these guys do. Uh, uh, and, and I think, and yesterday we heard from Torsten that they absolutely, the investment community pays very close attention to uh, the digital strategies of these companies, which has been hard to do, but it's all, ha as we've been predicting for years, this is clearly happening. So without that, Matt, tell us a little bit about sort of your group and your role at uh, Blackstone. Great. Well, well, first, thank you for having me. Great conference. Uh, obviously, very topical to be here and to talk and share a perspective on how we're approaching it. But more broadly, I think it's representative for really a lot of the themes that you just hit on that's happening in the economy. Um, so just my background, again, I've been at the firm for eight years. I'm a, a con I focus on econometrics and a, I'm a statistician and really work across our portfolio companies and our investment teams applying machine learning to our investing processes. And then we're a control-oriented buyout firm. So we own businesses around the world. We own roughly 230 companies uh, uh, across the US and across the world. Uh, and I'm responsible for integrating artificial intelligence as a core competency into these businesses. You talked about it earlier, um, but we really believe this is a source of competitive advantage in our businesses. And we really want, as, a, as an owner of these businesses, to be providing an unfair advantage to these companies, where we can build intellectual property, we can attract talent that individual companies cannot on their own. And we think that if we can create that ecosystem around that, that is a long-term sustainable competitive advantage. So we've been at this for the last eight years. It's been really successful on both the investing side and on the operating side. But we're owning these companies for the next 10 years. And we can maybe quibble of, do we think artificial intelligence is here today? The impact that's really going to have on the enterprise. But if you zoom out and you think, and you have a decade-long perspective, I think we would all say this is really going to define industry leaders. And we believe that you have to be really investing today to be capturing the flag around for each of these industries. So it's something we're really focused on. We've hired a really large team around it. Again, I was our first data scientist. Today we have over 50. Uh, we've hired over 150 into our portfolio companies. And it's really defined the types of companies we want to be owning. It's defined the types of companies or for the operating intervention that we really want to be driving in our ownership. And it's really defining how we think about the future of these industries. No, I think this 10-year horizon is really important because one of the things that's important to emphasize around these general purpose technologies is the time lag to value is very long. So in the case of electricity, it took 30 years for, these, for, for electricity to actually make a material impact in a measurable way on the economy, right? And so this may be a little bit faster, but at the end of the day, it still takes a lot of work within companies. So this 10-year horizon, I think, is, 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 is really important. But let, let's uh, start with you sort of giving us a couple of examples uh, of how you sort of deploy this technology in you know, two ways. One would be like when you acquire a company, what do you, how do you use AI to sort of evaluate a company that you may be acquiring? And the second, and I'll just in the interest of time put them together, uh, for a company that you're operating, how do you see the opportunity there? Uh, so, so one the, on the operating side, one on the inv investment Correct. Great. Um, well, first I'll just build on what you just talked about is that this idea of kind of the event horizon, how we think about adoption is that we, we do think that it is kind of a passive diffusion across the economy. And if you think about cloud, again, we're still multi-decades after the initial advent of cloud, and still less than 50% of workloads across the US are, have moved to the cloud. We, as an owner, want to accelerate that. And we want to be providing and pushing our companies and our boards to drive this. So we want to be very active owners, and we don't want this kind of passive diffusion. And we think this is a source of competitive advantage. So we want to be here to accelerate it. Um, so just asking for kind of tangible examples, maybe I'll give, again, one on the operating side, one on the investing side. Um, on the operating side, again, we have a hypothesis that our management, we buy great businesses, strong product market fit um, in both the digital and the traditional economy. Um, our favorite businesses to work in are large scaled players that have great businesses, but their CEOs don't know what a data scientist is, don't know how to hire a data scientist, and definitely don't know how to manage them. So that's where we come in. So we make it a really a easy yes for our companies. Uh, about a third of my team actually sits in our companies full time working for our CEOs. That again, back to this easy yes kind of orientation is 
every company, every board knows they have opportunities. I think it's actually a, a core source of anxiety for most of our boards. Um, so we want to give them a data scientist day one. So we own one of our, uh, an aviation business, Signature Aviation, the largest private aviation terminal in the US. And the management team always had a hypothesis that if you could better forecast incoming flights, you could be much more rigorous on how you think about your demand planning, how you think about your labor scheduling, how you think about pairing core services and procuring of even fuel. Um, so they have uh, over 150 bases across the country. Previously, all individual base managers are running this decision-making process themselves. And our hypothesis is that you can take these distributed decisions that are really happening at the, on the periphery and centralize them through AI. So we took all of these individual bases, we centralized it, we built this demand forecasting model, um, and we were able to drive a 62% improvement in accuracy for how we thought about incoming flights, being much more rigorous on how we thought at 21 days, 14 days, and seven days, giving each of our plant man or each of our base managers a much more rigorous approach for how they thought about this. We were able to drive $12 million of cost efficiency for how they thought about their procurement and their planning, while we were also able to increase the net promoter score by 16%. No longer did you have individual uh, base managers saying kind of, hmm, this is roughly what it was like last November. We now have a model that is taking weather, local events, thinking about this closed network of, of flights and propensity to move between airports, a much more statistically informed process that is informed by the, the, the network that we actually operate rather than these individual bases. A really different approach for thinking about these businesses. Yeah, two things jump out at me immediately from the, what you just said. So let's go to the operating side first, because you know I studied operations research as one of my many courses in grad school, and we've all known about the power of of uh, you know how you of optimization, but we just didn't have the data and the yeah. tools to actually do the optimization, you know, without a lot of sort of modeling or speculation. But this is real world data that uh, I think. Companies probably just didn't have the foresight to implement, and it's hard to implement if you're, you know, the kind of company that a PE firm might invest in. Uh, so I think that alone speaks to the opportunity that all of us have available to us, because I'm willing to bet even for the mature companies in this room, there's a lot of sort of easy pickings in terms of, you know, capturing more from your data and acting according to it. And sort of I'm intrigued on the, on, on the investment side some more as well, because you know, the way we did investment, to, you know, you compete against other firms that are trying to buy the same target. And if everybody, all they have access to is, the, is sort of the financial data, then yep, everybody's gone to the same schools and have the same NPV techniques. Yep. And, you know, you're ultimately going to come with similar estimations. So then it becomes sort of an auction without knowing exactly how you're going to win. Uh, but if you can identify that this company has more promise, you can perhaps bid a little bit higher. Uh, but you, you gave me this example where, in one case, you actually reduced your bid. So to me, it's fascinating how you can look from the outside and say, this company's not worth that much. Yeah. And, and I don't know that, and maybe I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, but you wonder if sort of some of the companies themselves know how, how they are being perceived and how good they are or how not so good they are. How, what do you do in that case where you sort of revise your uh, evaluation? I think it's important for the audience to understand that. Yeah, sure. So again, so I think an example that we shared um, was this idea that, uh, so again, 2019, we were looking at a retail business um, that we were initially, before data science was involved, we, were, we expected that this business would be pricing a 14% outside growth rate, something that the management team had a lot of confidence in. Um, a very data-rich business. Um, and if you look at their historical trends and you look at their management forecast, again, the, both our investors as well as our peers um, thought this business was a, a very dependable business. But when you took some of these more contemporary frameworks and you're actually able to unpack some of these both cohort pricing and customer acquisition trends, you can only see and you can only forecast through data science models. We ultimately actually uh, revised our bid by over 30%. We cut over $400 million of price off, to, uh, off what we thought this business was worth. We converted from a common security, which was an, an equity capital security, to one that had downside protection because we thought there was risk. And as you said, these are competitive processes. So we actually didn't win this auction. Um, one of our peers did. And earlier this year, uh, they got en entirely wiped out. Um, they levered this business. They thought this was going to be printing a 14% growth. We identified that we thought it was going to be meaningfully lower. Um, and it performed exactly as we saw. And what the real unlock, and that was a real unlock for our investment committee, 
obviously validation of a lot of things we're seeing. And we think there's going to be a lot more of these, but they take years to play out. Because again, if you think about the event horizon, you think about the kind of observations, it takes years for these businesses to ultimately see their way through. Um, but that was a realization um, that one, if you think about an aggregate statistic, total revenue, um, it's actually very easy to uh, conflate what is kind of high quality customers and being able to uh, uh, kind of boost that through lower short term marketing spend that is very hard to disaggregate if you're thinking about this in kind of a traditional finance perspective. Um, so we've really, as powerful it is as building these machine learning models, we've also rebranded the nomenclature and the vernacular with how we actually think about companies, thinking about individual cohorts, thinking about an ability to drive upsell and retention and, and, and new customer acquisition and thinking about seasoned customers versus new customers. None of those words kind of were part of our vernacular five years ago. Um, they're now core to how we think about investing. And as powerful as models are, I think equally powerful as a culture we talked about, you, you talked about the Rivian example, kind of a culture of analytics and having, in our case, traditional investors, traditional CEO operators, really thinking through a new digital prism. Um, and that is as much, I think, the role of the data scientist is obviously building the models, but great data scientists I think are also agents for change in an organization. They can really catalyze new thinking. And as we've thought about building our team and the archetype for what we're trying to hire for is you have to be technical, you have to understand the stats, you have to be able to build the models, but you also have to be really passionate about business and really drive a culture of influence to your decision making. Because kind of a truism for our team is the best and most powerful models in the world um, are pretty worthless if no one actually uses them. Yep. So that influencing and that ability to drive that change is equally important and really spend more time on during our interview process than we do uh, really just around the technical. So let's, let's dig a little deep, deeper to that. So when you go into these operating companies now that we're gonna focus on, did they, like, so clearly you're unlocking a lot of value. Uh, and the question I get for the companies that you already own, and you, you saw some of this when you acquired them, I'm guessing, but what do you see as the operators before Blackstone bought them actually not seeing? Like the, is it hard? I mean, you sort of alluded to some of this. I just wanted to put some priority on these things. That they don't see it. They don't have the money to invest in it. You sort of alluded that it's hard to even manage teams in yeah. AI, AI sense. It's a very different way of operating from things that some of these family-owned businesses, for example, have grown up doing. How yeah. do you sort of see that? Like, how do you characterize these companies? Yeah, well, maybe I'll first like zoom out and I'll give my little bit kind of 30,000 foot perspective is if you think about private equity, um, I think we're starting to enter a, a third phase of this. If you think about private equity V1, in the 80s it was really about financial engineering. It was carving out large businesses. It was giving them a proper capital structure. If you think about V2, it was really about cost takeout and it was driving efficiency and it was very ruthless uh, um, uh, operating efficiency metrics. Um, if you think about phase three and really where we think, where we really want to be leading and have been investing now for eight years in, is this idea of what are the capabilities that we can build centrally that our companies can't, that can really accelerate and unlock this growth. So, um, so getting back to this idea is each individual business, especially types of businesses that you referenced that, that private equity is buying, can't attract data scientists. And we want to build IP that is, that can rapidly deploy into these businesses and today really focus on four main modalities. One is pricing. A lot of businesses think about static pricing uh, regimes. We have had tremendous success in thinking about more of a dynamic pricing that takes an elasticity that is that we are deploying live machine, mo machine learning models that can better interact with customers and drive a better pricing strategy, largely on dynamic pricing. Second is this idea of demand forecasting. We talked about it in the aviation example, um, but it's, it's a different way of thinking about an operating cadence. It's, it's not asking your sales reps, it's not asking your plant managers, it's not asking the base managers what incoming flights are. It's maybe taking a purely statistical approach. And the best example of that is this kind of periphery to the core. The third is um, really around sales. And we've had a tremendous amount of success around thinking about much more prescriptively lead generation, much more prescriptively ex white space expansion, territory management. Um, and being much more rigorous around how we think about that process. And the fourth is really this modality of language. Uh, ChatGPT, language. Um, 
again, less about an efficiency play, but more about, especially for our software businesses, a new way of interacting with a customer, yep. especially for data businesses. So we, as part of this data science business and kind of the influence on investing, are acquiring large data businesses around the world. We bought Refinitiv, the large, one of the largest financial data businesses in the world. We bought Ancestry.com, this incredible data asset and family history. International Data Group, um, Bumble. The Everybody data in this room knows International Data Group. All right, good. I, IDC, uh, great, great plug, great business, great data assets. But you think about language as a way to interact with customers. Um, we're really excited about data businesses with this LLM overlay and ability to the first time interact with data in a more native uh, uh, medium. And also that if you think about that in the next year, maybe the next 18 months, the public internet, is the world is going to run out of data to train these models on. Yep. And we think that large proprietary data, data assets in discrete industries are really going to have kind of outsized pricing pressure, the pricing opportunity. Um, so we're excited about those types of businesses. So I'm going to ask you one last question, and I'll turn it over to the audience in just a minute. And that's how do you think, you know, we talk, I talked about risk, obviously, a lot. And I know you've thought a lot about the risks of AI. How do you manage the risks of AI at Blackstone? Yeah, it's obviously something we spend a lot of time thinking about. I would just give a plug for our, our founder and CEO, Steve Schwartzman, is, who's been a, a very large uh, philanthropic donor to the space, establishing the Schwartzman School of Computing at MIT, uh, providing the largest ever gift uh, in Oxford thousand year history to Oxford establishing the Oxford School of Ethics around AI. Um, so it's something that our founder has been very forward thinking on. And I think you know, most impressive this idea of pairing the technical innovation in MIT with the ethical responsibility in Oxford and something that needs to be tightly coupled. Um, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, obviously in, an, in our businesses thinking very specifically around the micro. Um, as an example, we, we previously owned a lending business um, where there's tremendous opportunity around deploying much more sophisticated models and spent as significantly more time with regulators, with our credit lending teams, ensuring that there was no bias in our model, ensuring we were not thinking about disadvantaging any underlying populations, but also being much more stringent on how we thought about capital allocation. You need to have a very strong ethical perspective and, and, and lens whenever you're approaching these business problems. I'd say around, you think about sales, demand forecasting, probably less direct ethical implications. But you think about language, and the advents they've seen in large language models, like I think there are a lot more meaningful risks. Obviously, much more meaningful risks as you think about privacy, much more meaningful risks as you think about some of the applications. But what keeps me up at night is less about the micro and more about the macro. And um, I personally am much more worried about, um, I think we could, we could debate where we think AGI is going to come and, and kind of the, the event horizon for that. But I think much more immediately in the next 18 months, like. I'm quite concerned about disinformation. Yep. I'm quite concerned about um, how you think about uh, kind of authenticity and verification. And I think that has very micro implications as we think about uh, 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 just verification of individuals. I think that has much more broad implications as we think about kind of authenticity and, and, and skepticism around information in the economy. I'm also, uh, uh, as a as a young father, like spending a lot of time thinking about like what it means, uh, again, being in a uh, hall of education, like what the pursuit of education yep. is like, how if, I think we all recognize that a computer is probably better than us at simple ar arithmetic, but if a computer is dominant in everything, I think that like has really broad societal risks and implications for how we think about education and pursuit of, of academia and excellence. Um, and I think that is what keeps me up at night, those kind of like two modalities of, of risk. Well, thank you for that. Let's just, uh, if we could turn the house lights up.